previously on every SNES RPG. There's actually one more Ultima game on Super Nintendo, believe it or not. I had never heard of it, because it was only released in Japan. As of November 2022, there is no fan translation, meaning I can't play it. You know, I thought I was done with Ultima. I did the NES games, I did the SNES games. The PC ones are for Spoonie and Magilar. I find these dumb ports to be more interesting anyway. They brought four to the Master System, there's a couple Game Boy games, and they put Underworld on PlayStation. But there was one inaccessible title. Savage Empire for the Super Nintendo was only released in Japan, and not only did it never receive a fan translation, there never appeared to be much interest in one either. There's a blog from 2013 about somebody decompiling the game, opening the doors for a possible translation, basically doing the hard part already, which is, you know, figuring out how to actually change the text in-game. But as for the translation work itself, well, nobody seemed interested enough to jump in and do it. That is until March 15th, 2024, when I was scrolling Reddit and just happened to see this post. Ultima Savage Empire Super Famicom Translation IPS First Attempt. And I had to do a triple take. It's as if this Reddit post was targeting specifically me. Like, really, could this be real? Did the one person in the universe who has the trifecta, technical skills, ability to read both languages, and is obsessive enough to put the time in translating what is likely to be a horrible video game? Did someone finally actually decide to put the work in for this dumb game? Reddit user Behind Times. You're a legend. People care about this astonishing development so little that it only got 18 upvotes. But this is like the biggest news of the decade in my neck of the woods, so just know that your efforts are greatly appreciated here. And you did an amazing job, by the way. There's quite a bit of dialogue in this game, and it has the whole branching path question and answer text system Ultima is known for. This could not have been quick or easy. Though I did notice that a lot of people say the same things. For example, if you're in a town, if you speak to multiple NPCs who look the same, they usually say the same things too, which I'm sure is a game problem and not a translator one. Anyway, aside from being the Lost Ultima release, what the heck is this game? Because I've found that even fans of the series sometimes haven't heard of this one. Ultima Savage Empire was a PC game which was made by repurposing Ultima 6's engine. When you spend years building a game for your RPG masterpiece, companies generally like to get more than one title out of it. In this case, they made three. Ultima 6, Savage Empire, and Martian Dreams, all of which recycle the same gameplay while inventing new worlds and stories to tell. Then on the other side, you have the Super Nintendo games, which, for a refresher, there's three of them. 6 was mostly a faithful port of the original PC version, with the same gameplay, story, and world intact. Runes of Virtue was its own thing, loosely adapted from a Game Boy game of all things. And Seven was basically an entirely different thing from the original. It's incredibly dumbed down and is much closer to a discount Zelda clone than a standard Ultima game. Despite Six already existing as basically the same game on Super Nintendo, and Savage Empire being based on top of Ultima Six, for some reason, they decided to base the port of Savage Empire on the Super Nintendo version of Ultima 7. Why wasn't 6 chosen instead of 7? Uh, cause 7, 8, 9? Who the hell knows, and why wasn't it ever released in English? Electronic Gaming Monthly showed screenshots of the game in English, meaning that it was at least partially translated at some point, but this build of the game was never released, or even leaked for that matter. So here we have a Western developed game that was originally a reskin of Ultima 6, which became a reskin of Ultima 7 that was translated into Japanese, but then never back into English? And by all accounts, this game is obscure even in Japan. You know how most Super Famicom games are dirt cheap over there? Well, not this one. And my attempts to use Google Translate to find more information about this game yielded almost nothing. I couldn't find any guides or maps or anything. 
for the Super Nintendo version of the game anyway, because there's tons of resources for the PC original, just nothing for this. Ultima Savage Empire might be the most obscure piece of media I've covered, including that one unreleased game that I talked about that one time. So yeah, this is, uh, this is my kind of shit is what it is. The game itself... Well, it's more Ultima 7. The overall gameplay is basically identical. If you're one of the only people in the world who enjoyed the Super Nintendo version of that game, then, oh boy, Savage Empire is a feast for you, and specifically you. And, well, truth be told, the SNES Ultima 7 isn't that bad. If you ignore the source material and just accept it for what it is, then it's an okay action RPG. You could certainly do much worse anyway. It's a lot better than the Lord of the Rings game or that dumb King Arthur game, for example. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that Ultima 7 SNES was actually good or something, but it's of an acceptable quality. Despite a horrific reputation, it's no Ultima 5 on the NES is what I'm trying to say. So here we have a long lost game that's basically more of the same, which I'm down for, I mean, that's all right. They even fixed my largest complaint with the last game because there's no more keys. Not like bats and Zelda, like actual keys to open doors with, you know? Which might sound like a stupid thing to point out, but unless you've played Ultima 7 SNES, you have no idea how much of it is spent fumbling with various keys. I swear that's like half the gameplay. In the great Ultima tradition, Savage Empire is another wide open, non-linear game that you're just kind of set loose in. The premise is, instead of being transported to Britannia, you get transported to a different fictional land, which is inhabited by tribes based on ancient civilizations from real-life Earth. You've got the Mayans, you've got Africans, you've got nomadic Mongolians, you've got Native Americans, basically just all the ethnic places. Britannia is where all the fictional white people live, and this new other world is where everyone else does. Anyway, a race of giant man-sized ants have recently appeared and are threatening to wipe out life as they know it, but the only way to fight these ants is to unite all of these fractured tribes so you can gang up and kill them all, I guess. The only problem being is that all the tribes hate each other and are engaged in a never-ending race war. It's up to you to find the missing delegates to the peace conf- No, I mean play diplomats to unite the tribes or whatever. So you can team up and play the smackdown on their candy asses. As opposed to Seven, which was kind of like a detective story, this one's more of an odyssey quest. Each of the 11 tribes are willing to join your alliance, but you have to do something for them first. Normally that just means bringing the chief a certain MacGuffin or defeating a monster that's been terrorizing the village, sometimes both. In this case, I need to retrieve the head of a statue which is being guarded by a giant. And the combat here is the most basic shit. I mean, look at this. He can't walk through the people and neutral NPCs don't take damage, so you can just use them as a human shield. It ain't easy being cheesy. Actually, it is. It's much easier being cheesy. What's funny, though, is immediately after this, I got ambushed by a pterodactyl and had to do it again. When you die in this game, you go back to whenever you last saved, which is fine because as long as you're not inside of a cave or dungeon, you're allowed to save anywhere. Another type of quest this game leans heavily on are scavenger hunts, aka fetch quests. For this tribe to agree to our union, I have to bring them five obsidian swords. Luckily, you can just get them at the store, but buying these fucking swords sucked. They cost a hundred emeralds each, and it's a huge grind to save up that much. Most enemies only drop one at a time, but most of the time, none. It's randomized. But there is, like, pretty much everything else in this game, an easy way to cheese this. Because whenever you leave an area, everything respawns. So all you gotta do is find a house with some emeralds inside, grab them, leave, come back in, grab them again, leave, come back in, grab more emeralds, and repeat until you have enough money. I'm not entirely sure I would have ended the whole game with 500 emeralds total if they didn't make me do this for this one quest. And this works with more than just money, in fact, I use this trick for every item that you constantly need more of. 
In order to cast magic in this game, you need to have different kinds of plants. The one that you're gonna be casting most often is the light spell, and for that, you need cocoa beans. You'll be using the light spell constantly, because every cave and dungeon in this game is dark by default. There's also a day-night system, which only exists to make the game more annoying at night. There's no way to sleep off the night, you just have to wait it out. That, or cast the light spell, which is what you'll be doing. The day-night thing is completely superfluous. None of the NPCs have schedules or anything. Nobody acknowledges the darkness except for your field of vision. Nobody even goes inside at night. It just exists to drain your resources a little faster, to make you cast the light spell more often. Anyway, just find a house with cocoa beans, leave, come back, until you have 99 of them. Yes, 99, because you're gonna need every last one of them. I sure as hell did. And then some. Anyway, I bought five swords, and I think you have to buy all five. I don't think you can just, like, find them or make them. I never saw one out in the world anyway, but I'll never know for sure. Which brings me to my main hurdle when getting through this game. I use guides. I know that's somewhat controversial, but I can't just be stuck in these games all the time. I don't go into a game with a guide already ready to go, but if I'm playing and I don't know what to do, I'm not gonna bash my head up against a wall until I figure it out. I'm gonna look it up. Once in a while though, you come across a game where you can't because there aren't any guides. Considering this fan translation just came out a month ago, of course there's nothing for this. I couldn't even find one in Japanese, not for the Super Nintendo version anyway. The PC one, of course, has tons of guides, but that's an entirely different game. The overall objectives seem to be mostly the same, but the map and dungeon design are not transferable at all. Also, it's just in general a completely different kind of game. As we discussed, it's based on Ultima 6, not Ultima 7. My point is, when you're playing something like this, if you get stuck, there is no help. You watching this have three options. Quit playing the game, wander around until you figure out what to do, or as a last Hail Mary, I guess you could either ask me or the Reddit user behind times. Because as far as I know, we're the only two people in the English speaking world who have seen most of this game. Of course, for me, quitting wasn't an option. And I can't ask myself, meaning that my only lifeline would have been asking this guy, which I almost did actually, but eventually figured it out before I had to resort to that. No, playing this game was like playing a game in the 90s. I just had to power my way through it. Because I got stuck twice, completely flummoxed. Want to hear about them? Well, the first time it had to do with making grenades. There's a character in the game who explains in great detail how to make the grenades, but I still couldn't figure it out for a while. He tells me I need to fill a bucket with tar, find cloth to make a fuse, find an unglazed pot, and to find gunpowder, and then to combine all these things to make a grenade. Which, okay, firstly, where do I find any of this stuff? Because he sure as hell doesn't tell you, and nobody else in this game tells you either. You just have to take note of everything you need and then look for it out in the world. Which is fine, in fact, a lot of this game is like that. They'll tell you about a certain item, and then it's up for you to go find where it is. But you can look high, and you can look low, and you will never find gunpowder. You'll find a rifle, you'll find bullets, but there's no gunpowder anywhere in the game. I discovered this by complete accident, but what you're supposed to do is make your own gunpowder. In various houses throughout the game, there's this mixing bowl laid out on the floor, and if you throw in various different kinds of powders you can find laying around, they'll mix together to form new items. It's an incredibly primitive crafting system, but this is how you're supposed to make gunpowder. Once I figured that out, I could finally make grenades. One at a time, it consumes your cloth, it consumes your bucket, it consumes your pot, it consumes all the items you gather just to make one grenade. So it's super time intensive. And grenades in this game sort of act like bombs in Zelda 1, albeit they're not used nearly as much. But imagine you're playing Zelda 1, and instead of finding bombs all over the place or buying them from a store, every time you wanted more bombs, you had to go on a lengthy scavenger hunt just to make one singular bomb. That would suck, right? 
and you'd sure as hell be using a lot fucking less of them. These things were so valuable that before I would even think about using one, I would save the game out of fear of wasting it. Remember, as long as you're not inside a cave or a dungeon, you're allowed to save anywhere. Thankfully, you never need a grenade inside of a dungeon. And my gamer sense from a lifetime of playing Zelda games and SNES RPGs trained me to spot where you are actually supposed to use them. For example, this rock? I don't know what it was. Maybe it was that there's very few other standalone rocks that look like this anywhere else in the game. Maybe the fact that it's all by itself at this otherwise dead end. But something about it was asking for a grenade. And voila! Underneath was a spear, but not just any spear. This is the special Spear of Schmamp, a quest item required to finish the game. There's also this palm tree which you need to blow up so you can use it as a bridge to cross this chasm. Blowing up this rock opens up a secret cave hidden under a waterfall. <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> that was... Man, this whole game just has, like, cheap game stank all over it. <laughs> Basically, whenever you see this rock sprite, blow it up because something good always happens. The other time I got stuck in this game, the other sticking point was driving me up a fucking wall. I was so frustrated at this point. So, most of the dungeons in this game, in fact, all of them with one exception, are small, single-screen caves with maybe some spiders or something inside. Like this one. Oh god damn, you give me a fucking chance? I, I enter the cave and there's just spiders all over the place. I didn't stand a fucking chance. This game has no chill with just enemies popping up out of nowhere. I mean, look at this. This bear literally appeared out of thin air. Anyway, I'm getting off track. Dungeons are simple, except for this one lone example. This lost city, which is actually built up pretty well, and gaining entrance to this place is the culmination of a bunch of different quests put together. But man, fuck this place. First off, it's enormous. This one dungeon feels like it's about as big as A Link to the Past Silver World. And no, I'm like not even fucking exaggerating. And there's dozens and dozens of these switches that both open and close doors. You feel like you're running through a maze just blindly hitting switches, just hoping that you can inch a little further each time you hit a switch. So finishing this game took me almost 20 hours. This stupid place was five of them. I was just running around like a chicken with its head cut off, making no progress, just hitting switches willy-nilly, desperate for any kind of a map, or a switch guide, or hell, even a long play on YouTube I could watch just to see what switches they hit, but there's nothing. And you wanna know what I missed? You wanna know what was making this part impossible for me to get through? You wanna see it? All right, well, pucker your ass, pucker your mouth, because you might be more angry than I was. Because when I figured this out, I just kinda laughed. Look at this, look at this hidden wall. Look at this nasty hidden wall. You see this? Oh, man. That's fucking disgusting, game. And if that's not enough, if that's not enough. And uh, let's zoom in on this pot for uh, no particular reason. Wait, do you see that? Let me do it again, let me do it again. You see that? You need a fucking magnifying glass. But underneath this pot is another hidden switch, as if the hidden wall wasn't enough. As an extra fuck you, there's a hidden switch under this pot. Man, oh man, oh man. Oh yeah, and this place, like everywhere else, is dark by default, so you constantly have to be casting the light spell every minute or so. And don't die, because remember, you can't save inside dungeons. That includes this one. You die, you get sent back outside. Do it all again, motherfucker. Oh man. It's just, you know, it's dealing with guide moments inside of games when there exists no guide. It's frustrating, right? Because this is the kind of thing where in a normal review, I look it up and I move on with my life. Maybe I mention the hidden wall, but I don't like harp on it forever. But when there's like nothing to turn to, when there's no help, when it's just you versus the game, this kind of shit drives you up a wall. So the whole point of this dungeon was to blow up a generator like a modern generator that somebody from your time came back to the past and was basically ruling the world with. And this was the final tribe uniting quest I had to do, so... After that, it's finally time to finish the damn game. And for an entire game of build-up, this was... 
one of the most disappointing things I've ever seen. There's not even like a cutscene or anything. All that happens is you summon the tribes, you get some text boxes with various portraits representing each of the tribes. You don't even see all of them, you only see a few of them. Then you're teleported inside of a cave, it's dark, I'm instantly mobbed by ants. Like, what the fuck, game? Give me a fucking chance, I can't even get out, what the- ah! Game, slow down, slow down. There was no moment to breathe at all. One second, you're talking to the tribal leaders. The next one, you're inside of a cave surrounded by ants and you die without as much of a second to react. But you're telling me that the whole game, this entire game has been a quest to unite all of the tribes of the world. I've been going all around the world doing shit for them, but when the time comes to finally confront the ants, they send me in by myself anyway? Why? What? This is so hilariously fucking stupid. It's just, it's such a cheaply made game. This is such a piece of crap. Jesus. They really did not give a fuck or have enough of a fuck of a time to really implement anything in this game, right? It's just the bare bones, bare basic of what you need. We don't need cutscenes. We just need some text boxes and whatever. Fuck you. You're in the final dungeon. Anyway, the only weapon which hurts the final boss, this giant queen ant, is a staff that you hit things with Quest 64 style. She's not as easy to cheese because she's constantly hatching minions which bunch up to attack you, but still, it's not that hard. I just kind of ran around getting hits in whenever the game let me, and eventually, big ants go boom. But the game keeps going and the other ants still attack. Who just, please don't die, not after that. Then it's time for the ending. All right, are you ready to be maybe the third person in the entire English-speaking world who has seen the ending of this game? Well, I mean, add in however many views this video has. Well done, Avatar! My only dialogue, my only dialogue choice is goodbye. That's all I can say to it. Both the corrupted Moonstone and Mimrex Queen are vanquished. As soon as the Moonstone was destroyed, all the remaining Mirmex went crazy and died. <laughs> that's... that's how you explain away all the little ants? The Mirmex are... that's the name of the ants. Just when you destroyed their leader, they all went crazy and died? That's pretty funny. All the tribes have pledged peace, a feast to celebrate, yada yada yada, blah blah blah. We're all friends now, but nope, I gotta go home because I don't want to live in the past. I don't want to live in like Africa or wherever this is. Bye, fuck you. And that was Ultima Savage Empire. Was it good? Not really. Am I glad it was translated? Oh, hell yeah. This is like a fever dream. I can't believe it's actually real. I can't believe I actually got to play it. Am I done with Ultima again? Uh, maybe. I don't know, I might do a cleanup special someday where I power through the Game Boy games and the Master System port of 4 and the PlayStation port of Underworld. But not today. Shout out to the patrons, shout out to William Robert Lee, shout out to Zachariah Braun. Never trust anyone who needs a haircut, goodbye.